Okay, uh, greetings. This is to be a lecture on aesthetic reasoning. And um, it's uh, nearing the end uh, of this course on critical thinking. And we've looked at moral reasoning, we'll look at aesthetic reasoning, and then we'll finish by looking at legal reasoning. Um, I think it's important to add this uh, module because uh, of the tendency, and <clears throat> this has come up when we looked at moral reasoning, um, of people sort of to dismiss aesthetic reasoning as uh, well, it's not you know empirical and scientific, and therefore it's there's probably no real reasoning going on when you make aesthetic judgments and you judge one work of art to be superior to another or something more beautiful than something else or whatnot. I think that's mistaken, and um, I think that there really are reasons for advancing or for um, uh, preferring one. Uh, aesthetic object over another. It's controversial. Some people may not agree, but at least you'll have an idea of what some people have historically thought of were pertinent uh, aesthetic reasonings and, um, and uh, qualities of artwork and uh, works of beauty that are relevant for establishing claims about aesthetics. So having said that, let me uh, share my screen. Where is it? Here we go. Okay, and I call this my four theories of art lecture. Now I have shamelessly borrowed from a lecture I had prepared for my introduction to philosophy class, where we would look at various theories about the nature of art, but it's relevant to ours. So I've repurposed this a bit and actually I've expanded a bit. So now actually I would have to call it that, I want this there, uh, four theories of art plus a few more, <laughs> but I don't not find that funny. Well, the first theory of art that we're going to look at is called the mimetic theory. And in order to remember what mimetic is about or what the mimetic theory is talking about, concentrate on the first three letters, no, four letters, right? Mime, M-I-M-E. So this is the idea that art is essentially about miming or mimicking nature. So it's an imitation of nature. Then we'll look at formalism, which is uh, a different account of art and what the nature of art is. After that, we'll look at expressive theory, which is yet a third account of what the nature of art is and what values we, uh, we seek in art or what advances uh, or it recommends something as a good work of art. Then we're gonna look at romanticism and actually romanticism is a sort of version of expressive theory. So it doesn't exactly count as a freestanding uh, theory of art, but um, it is slightly different than expressive theory. Again, it's a version. Uh, and then we'll look at media formalism, which I think is a slightly different uh, account of art. It's related to formalism, but it's importantly different. And we'll look at that in a moment. And then the last thing we're gonna do is look at the institutional theory of art, which is curious in that it's denying that there is a single uh, universal nature to works of art. And that actually poses certain problems for anyone who wants to say that there are elements which recommend a work of art as superior or um, um, and argue for, for the superiority of one work of art over another. But we'll get to that in a moment. So the four real theories of art that are uh, freestanding are mimetic, expressive theory, formal theory, and media formalism. So we'll start off with mimetic theory, probably the oldest account of art in Western thought. Um, artists, estheticians, and uh, philosophers from the ancients up till about the 1700s all pretty much accepted this as the account of what the nature of art is. So a lot of art was produced with this theory of art in mind. A lot of art was, um, artists were working with this in the background. So even if, this isn't the only account of art there is. It's a useful account of art to be aware of because it will explain a lot of what previous generations of artists, centuries and centuries of generations of artists were seeking to do in their work. So essentially it's this idea that art is an imitation of nature and later art is a representation or representation of nature. <laughs> Those turn out not to be exactly the same thing, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the idea here is that paintings are supposed to imitate visual scenes and the painter is supposed to be depicting, I don't know, flowers or, or, or uh, you know, landscapes or portraits, 
right? Of sculptures are supposed to imitate three-dimensional objects. Uh, dramas are supposed to imitate human behavior. And so uh, again, uh, the art forms, um, painting, sculpture, drama, um, uh, other art forms as well are all supposed to be imitations of nature in one sort or another, a narratives, you know, uh, uh, whoops. Yeah, okay. Now, to be perfectly honest, music was always a little bit difficult for this theory to, um, to count, account for, because it's not entirely clear what music is supposed to imitate. Um, you know, you could maybe, it imit there were pastoral symphonies that sort of imitated um, uh, supposedly uh, forest sounds or bird song or that sort of stuff, but it was always a, not a particularly easy fit. Um, in the Renaissance, um, Marsilio uh, Fincino, I think is how you say his name, um, was a Neoplatonist, and he suggested that just as there is a divine geometry which explains the the um, the ordering of the various uh, celestial bodies, uh, so too music appealed to this kind of geometric pattern. It was long understood that there is a sort of geometric pattern to the creation of music, the relations of chords, fifths, and octaves and uh, thirds, etc. And so he was thinking that, well, maybe it's an imitation of this divine geometry. But again, it wasn't a very easy fit. Now, if we are to accept this view, it would imply that good art is art which accurately imitates nature and bad art does not accurately imitate nature. So in other words, we would evaluate art and we would recommend works of art uh, for their faithfulness in the to the degree that they imitate or they represent nature. So the evaluative criterion then is good art would do what art is supposed to do. And if art is supposed to imitate, well then good art would be art that imitates well. Um, so it's not just an identity criteria, right? So it's not only is this what art, uh, this is what identifies art as art, it's an imitation of nature, but it's also an evaluative criterion. Now, even if we, admit that uh, mimesis, mimicking, right, is an essential feature of art, and some people would deny that, but even if we admit that it is necessary, it wouldn't necessarily be sufficient, because there are other things that imitate nature or represent nature, which are not artwork. Um, so, for instance, maps, um, although you young people maybe you don't know what maps are these days, but maps um, do, do imitate or represent the world, but we don't think of them as works of art, or at least uh, aside from perhaps very special occasions, uh, they aren't really works of art, they're kind of technical things. Graphs represent things, uh, we don't think of those as art. So that it represents might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Now Plato um, did think that art was essentially mimetic, so he, would, he had held this view. But further, because he thought art was essentially an imitation of nature, he thought it had little or no value. Right? Uh, why would I look at imitations of nature? If I'm interested, I might as well just look at nature itself. And it didn't seem to engage the mind in any way. He also was concerned that it seems to be inherently deceptive, uh, that, uh, that artists are interested in you know, creating these imitations of nature and hopefully perhaps even getting you to be deceived into thinking it's the real thing. There was a famous uh, contest in ancient antiquity between two Greek painters, both of whom were very, very celebrated, and they were brought in uh, to have a contest and to see who was the greater of the two painters. And so uh, when the, the final uh, period came where they were going to uh, uh, decide which of these two painters was a um, was superior. The one that uh, unveils his painting and he takes the veil off and it was a, a depiction of, of, I don't know, berries or cherries or bowl of fruit or something like that. And it said that the birds would fly down and try to peck at the cherries in the painting because it was so realistic and everybody thought that was so wonderful. Oh my gosh, surely he's won the contest. So then they turn to the other artist and then they go, well now unveil your painting. He says, there is no veil on my painting. And so they had, they had all thought that it was a veiled painting when in fact, it was just a cleverly painted scene. And so the idea is the faithfulness and the representation was so authentic that it would deceive. Well, Plato didn't really like that idea, 
right? Um, if you're familiar with Platonic thought, and don't worry about it, you don't need to be. But he thought, you know, the real goal of the philosopher is to um, uh, discern genuine reality from uh, imitation or from fictitious reality, real truth from apparent truth, real goodness from apparent uh, goodness, and even real beauty from apparent uh, beauty. But the artist seems to be dealing entirely in deception and, and hoping to fool people. So he didn't really think that was a particularly good thing. He also thought that when you ask artists, well, how did you come up with this? He said, pretty much anybody in the city could speak better about their work than they could. And so he likened their abilities, their creative abilities to, um, uh, to a kind of divine madness where uh, uh, like someone who prophesizes and doesn't know why, and it just comes to them, uh, the, the muse moves them to create these things, but they themselves are, are not really um, cognizant of why they create them or why they're any good. Now, Aristotle was Plato's biggest uh, student and biggest critic. And he did acknowledge or he did accept that art was essentially mimesis, but he thought that Plato gets the notion of mimesis wrong. Plato just thought that the artist is copying the world, like a mirror that copies the world without having any intelligence, without having any uh, grasping or understanding. But what uh, Aristotle claims is no, the artist isn't just copying the world, the artist is representing the world. So what the artist does is the artist uh, consolidates and condenses uh, the, the world of his experience or her experience and then represents it in an idealized form. So I might see this rose and I see this rose and I see this rose and then I condense all of that down and I represent the, the uh, ideal rose, right? The distilled ideal rose. So notice that involves my understanding and I'm able to re um, present uh, the essential features of the rose and I can discard the accidental uh, features, the non-essential features of the rose. So I really have understand rose nature very carefully or very, um, very thoroughly. And I'm able to give you that understanding when you see my work, right? Um, uh, Aristotle had said that uh, dramatists are more philosophical than historians because historians just tell you what happens to have happened, but dramatist tells you what must happen or what is likely to happen. And his idea here is that uh, art isn't or, or drama isn't just presenting human behavior, it's presenting human actions. And human actions are always motivated by psychological features, love or jealousy or guilt or this sort of thing. So what the dramatist is doing is representing something real. Now, maybe not history, right? Um, there may not be a sad prince of Denmark. But there were people like Hamlet who were plagued by feelings of, of guilt or, um, or feelings of uh, confusion, et cetera. So we can gain psychological insight into real human nature by engaging with these dramas. At least this is what Aristotle thought. So he did think that art was mimetic. And he did think that the artist is interested in representing nature but that it was involved with truth and knowledge and understanding and was therefore a rather good thing. Again, Aristotle acknowledges that art could stir up strong emotions, but this was good, he thought, because it can purge us of these strong emotions and allow for a, um, a, a therapeutic release of these strong uh, emotions or a transformation of these strong emotions into something that is healthy. And this was his doctrine of catharsis. He gets a lot of um, uh, uh, airtime for that, but he himself actually didn't say that much about it. So uh, people have had to try to uh, theorize what he might have meant by his doctrine of catharsis. But again, the general uh, tenor of it, we know, which is he thinks that the negative emotions that we might feel are somehow transformed or purged through our exchanges with art. Um, and so this was one of his defenses of art against Plato's criticisms. So we have some of the first aesthetic reasons for recommending a work of art. Specifically, an artwork is thought to be superior if it faithfully represents some aspect of the world, faithful portraits or realistic acting, etc. So I might praise 
uh, a painting because it is such a faithful re rendering of the actual person's face or of uh, a landscape or something like that. I might praise a bit of acting because it was so realistic and so engaging. Conversely, we might criticize a work of art for being false or misleading or misrepresenting reality. And again, we aren't really taken into movies which have unbelievable plot twists or have wooden acting, etc. And we think that those are bad making qualities. Why? Because you're not faithfully or powerfully representing. Note further that for Aristotle, at least, um, those that and those that follow his view of mimesis, art did have a cognitive value. It engages the mind in both its production, to that, that condensation, that distilling down to the essence of a thing, and its appreciation, where you see that that's precisely what the artist has done. And it was in virtue of these cognitive values that art was to be prized and supported, according to Aristotle. But note further that the standard for excellence in art's relation is art's relation to something external to art. So what we're looking at is how does this art, um, does it faithfully represent the real world? So the, art, the excellence of the work is judged by its relationship to the real world. And art had to sort of sing for its supper. In other words, to be good art, uh, worth the amount of money and resources we spend on it, it should be doing something therapeutic for us, right? Catharsis or gaining an understanding, engaging our minds, etc. So the next view of art that we're going to look at, formalism, is a break from that tradition. And they were trying to locate the value of art in the work itself, not something extraneous to the work like social utility, but something in the work at, uh, of uh, art. So formalism came out of the 18th and 19th century fascination with beauty and other aesthetic qualities like awe or sublimity. But more precisely, formalism derives from seeking an enlightenment scientific understanding of beauty. So remember that the enlightenment happens in the, um, uh, well, the maybe the uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, uh, and it was a fascination with science, right? The scientific revolution of people like Galileo and Newton. And so they wanted a scientific understanding of reality in general, but even a scientific understanding of beauty and art. And so formalism was uh, began as a way of trying to understand art and beauty from a scientific perspective. So Enlightenment thinkers posited an aesthetic sense, which they believed was stimulated by certain formal arrangements. So just as um, we have a, um, a reaction, uh, for instance, a sweet reaction that is stimulated by a sense, right? A gustatorial sense. And it's certain formal structures in the world that cause in us that sweet reaction, right? Certain molecular structures hook up with our taste buds in a certain way, and they cause in us this sweet sensation. They want to suggest that beauty is a kind of internal sensation that is caused in us by certain formal structures in the world. And they might cert, uh, cite um, certain uh, formal uh, features of paintings or music or sculpture uh, that would explain why we respond to them the way that we do and we find them aesthetically fascinating, beautiful, or awe-inspiring. And they might point out in, in visual uh, art, you might talk about balance or movement or symmetry in paintings. Or in music, you might recognize harmonies, chords, discords. These are formal qualities of the works of themselves. This view understands works of art as unique arrangements, but arrangements of what? Well, the formalist is going to seek to identify formal elements unique to that artistic medium, and then the formal principles by which those elements are arranged and governed, and how you assemble those elements. Um, so for formalism, the most important thing to look for in works of art is the way those works of art have been designed where design refers to a perceptual quality, not a historical quality. <laughs> so um, you might look at something that was not uh, intentionally designed, but you might still attend to its formal qualities and find it to be aesthetically fascinating. 
formalists reject the idea that it is a relation to something outside the work, which gives the work artistic value, but rather it must be something internal to the work and something that is immediately given in perception. So as I look at the work, I can see that it has or it lacks value. I don't have to know what it's representing or what it's about or what it's supposed to be or something like that. And how do I do that? I attend to the formal elements and their um, relations, their formal relations. And these are the principles by which they've been assembled. It might have been an intentional uh, assemblage where an artist understanding formal elements, understanding formal principles, puts them together in a way that is compelling. Or it may have been an accidental feature. They, they simply have fallen together in such a way. What matters though, is that the elements are arranged in a way that we find aesthetically compelling. So when it comes to, if you wanna, what am I talking about these visual, uh, these elements of, of, of the arts, it, they differ from medium to medium to medium, right? But in the, the visual medium, right? Painting, printmaking, this sort of stuff, it's acknowledged that color is one element. Value is a different element. Line is an element, texture is another element, shape is another element, form is an element, and space is an element. And if you're wondering the difference between color and value, notice if I um, took a black and white photo of a color um, uh, painting, all the values would be there, but the colors would be lost. So the values is this sort of the intensity, the saturation, of the color field as opposed to the shade of the color field. Now, when it comes to principles, we have various principles of visual arts, balance, emphasis, harmony, variety, gradation, movement, rhythm, proportion. And we don't need to get too worried about that, but notice um, uh, if I were to say, be commenting on, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Well, you know, if you're familiar with the painting, there's a bright yellow moon that seems to be balanced by the dark cypresses in the other corner of the painting. And so there's this sort of symmetric relationship going on where you have uh, different colors, but uh, similar values that are balancing one another, right? So notice that would be very typical of a formal analysis of um, Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> or it's been noted, for instance, that um, there are strong triangular arrangements in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, The Last Supper. And these are actually uh, similar uh, triangular arrangements that we find in Picasso's Guernica, which of course uh, are very different in terms of their subject matter and what they represent, but they are trading on similar formal principles and formal elements. So this is what formalists say we should be looking for in works of art, what recommends certain works of art is that these uh, principles and these elements have been arranged in ways that are aesthetically compelling. So formalism maintains that art is the construction of aesthetically fascinating objects and events, stimulating our aesthetic sense, and that good art constructs objects which are genuinely aesthetically fascinating, and bad art fails to do so. Bad art fails to stimulate this aesthetic sense, <laughs> they haven't exploited the formal elements and the formal principles to their best advantage. Formalism posits, as I said, this sort of unique aesthetic sense and a unique kind of pleasure, which they call aesthetic pleasure. This is the sort of pleasure that you get when looking at art or other things in a disinterested way. Now, disinterested needs to be explained here. When they say disinterested, they don't mean uninterested, like you're bored. Disinterested means you're not taking a personal interest. You're not looking for any practical gain. So if I'm looking at a bowl of fruit uh, as a possible snack, well, I'm looking at it in an interested way. I'm hungry and I'm wondering about that. And notice from that perspective, it matters very much to me whether that's a real bowl of fruit or whether that's a, a bowl of wax fruit, or whether it's a hologram, right? Or whether it's an optical illusion. It's reality as a bowl of fruit is important to me because I'm looking at it in an interested way, again, as a potential snack. But if I'm looking at it in a disinterested way, it doesn't matter to me 
whether it's a real fruit or wax fruit or a hologram, I am indifferent to its actual existence because all I'm looking at are the colors, the shapes, the space, the line, um, the, how they've been arranged, symmetry or balance or emphasis, et cetera. Right? So again, if you're attending to the formal elements and their formal uh, principles of arrangement, you are solely, uh, and you're doing that alone, then you're engaged in a disinterested appreciation. And this is how we ought to engage art according to um, the formalist. But notice we might uh, uh, extend that same kind of viewing, that disinterested viewing to things besides art, like sunsets or flowers or bowls of fruit or landscapes, etc. So again, this aesthetic pleasure is characterized by an immediate gratification, but without direct practical gain or benefit. We just enjoy the beauty. We just enjoy the satisfaction that we're taking in the, the, the colors and the shapes and their arrangements. Kant put it this way, Immanuel Kant I have in mind here. Uh, Kant put it this way, we do not care whether the object before us is real imitation or wholly an illusion, when appreciating it aesthetically or disinterestedly. We are indifferent to the object's actual existence because we are not engaged with it practically. Rather, we are appreciating it as an object of experience only and in delighting in the qualities, again, the formal qualities, these objects present as an object of experience. <laughs> so again, um, there are variations of formalism and various accounts of formalism and, and uh, trying to get into the actual uh, psychology of aesthetic appreciation. But we can just say that this is one view about the nature of art is not necessarily to represent, but maybe the nature of art is to present us with these formal constructions for our aesthetic enjoyment. So notice with the advent of formalism, we have the the also the advent of non-representational forms of uh, art, non-representational non -representational paintings, non-representational uh, um, sculptures, etc. And also formalism seems a little bit better able to explain what it is we find important about music because it's not so much what music is representing, but rather the formal constructions of music. Um, think about all of the musical syntax that goes into chord structure and tempo and rhythm, etc. Now, Kant also talks about being able to appreciate a purposefulness to things without being aware of their actual purpose. So the idea is if I come into a beautiful, um, uh, uh, I don't know, meadow, and there seems to be a rightness about it. There seems to be a design-like quality. I'm not saying there is, and that I know what the purpose of that meadow is, and it very well might not have a purpose, but there seems to be a purposefulness about it. And again, I think what Kant is trading on is that sense of satisfaction and rightness as we view, uh, it's as if it were the product of intelligent uh, design. Also, he talks about the mind engaging in a kind of free play, the product of which is not useful judgments, but a sort of fanciful musing. So when I look at the rose and I think, you know, that rose is almost flirtatious. Well, it's not literally flirtatious. So I can play and my mind engages in a kind of a free musing and I find that enjoyable. So that might also be the source of the aesthetic enjoyment presenting people with these sort of ambiguous um, images where they can play with the kinds of um, the kinds of adjectives they're attaching to it because the, the goal is not a practical judgment. Oh, that is a yellow Texas rose. That would be a judgment, but that's a flirtatious rose, not a real judgment. It's just fun. Right? Actually, Kant talks more about natural beauty and natural things like flowers, sunsets, and mountains than he does art. But Many have followed him as a, uh, this as a proper way to approach art as well. Formalism, or at least a formalist appreciation, is often used as a vehicle in art appreciation classes. Perhaps you've had exposure to this already if you've taken a class in art appreciation, where the the, uh, the professor might go through a painting and talk about certain formal elements. Again, things we've talked about: line, uh, shape, uh, uh, volume. Uh, and then principles like balance or emphasis, right? 
The 20th century esthetician Clive Bell posits significant form as a feature by which an object is able to elicit aesthetic emotion as opposed to the emotions of life. So uh, Bell is a more recent 20th century esthetician. And he says that, look, paintings can invoke in us the emotions of life where we, they might make us feel sad or they might make us feel happy or, or dour or gloomy uh, or, or patriotic. But those are emotions of life. What the artist is trying to do is evoke in us the aesthetic emotion. And the only thing that prompts in us the aesthetic emotion is what he calls significant form. Now, that significant form is what prompts this sort of arresting oh, kind of thing that some works of art are able to, uh, to achieve, right? I remember talking with a, a student one time who said when he first saw a Rauschenberg painting in, in person in New York City, uh, he began to weep. He was so overcome. He wasn't sad in the sense of emotionally sad. Right? It was an abstract painting, but he was just overcome by the, the aesthetic uh, significant form of it all. Now, unfortunately, um, Clive does not, uh, Clive Bell, uh, the, the esthetician I'm referring to here, doesn't give us a great deal of detail about what exactly significant form is. He says, well, significant form is what prompts the aesthetic emotion. And you go, oh, what is the aesthetic emotion? He goes, well, the aesthetic emotion is what's prompted by significant form. But he goes on to say that anybody who's had the aesthetic emotion knows precisely what it is. And if you haven't had it, then I couldn't possibly explain it to you. That sounds a little bit cagey, I'm a little suspicious of that. We have a little bit of a vicious circle going on, but he does have a kind of a point, right? If you've never experienced white, then I can't explain it to you. And if you have experienced white, then I, you know exactly what white is, so. Bell uses this a significant form, not only as an evaluative criteria, but also as an identity criteria. On his view of art, the purpose of art is not to teach us messages. The purpose of art is to be aesthetically fascinating. The wrong question to ask is, what is that about? Or what is that supposed to be? The right thing to do is to look at art. And so this is a species of art for art's sake perhaps heard that phrase before. So what formalists uh, insist is that we must find the value of art in the art itself and not in the work that art does or some relationship that art bears to some other uh, non-art thing. Most formalists view the aesthetic experience as non-cognitive or perhaps a very low level of cognition. If beauty and aesthetic experience name only private experience and sensations, then art teaches us very little or nothing about the external world, but that's not its job, the formalist would say. So if it teaches us nothing, um, uh, that's not a terrible thing. Um, uh, the great uh, advocate of art, um, oh gosh, all of a sudden I can't think of his name, playwright, Oscar Wilde, uh, famously quipped that all art is quite useless. Right, but the uh, but the the only reason to uh, to value art is because one admires it intensely for what it is on its own. Further, if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then convergence of our judgment of beauty is best explained by biological sort of bottom up features rather than a cognitive top down engagement. So it might be that there are certain structures in the world that stimulate neurological. Um, uh, uh, pre-existing neurological capacities. I mean, this is just a modern upda up um, update of the uh, formalist uh, sense, uh, aesthetic sense theory. So, so maybe there is a sort of biological explanation for this aesthetic sense, which is stimulated by certain formal structures, just as our sweet sensation is explained by formal structures and a pre-existing biology. The pros, well, the theory claims that one should not judge art by moral, social, educational, political work, but judge it by its own unique value. Um, 
Again, Oscar Wilde famously says, books are either well-written or badly written, and that is it. So the idea that you're going to evaluate the goodness of a book based on its moral teaching is a mistake. Then you're not evaluating as a work of art, and you've left, um, uh, you're, you're uh, not engaging with it as a work of art. You're engaging with it as something else, maybe propaganda. Also, the theory provides us with a way of approaching any and all works of art and talking about and critically assessing it. So I can look at maybe Japanese um, uh, ceramics and not have a clear understanding of where it came from, what it's about, what it's supposed to do, what it was for, and still engage with it in terms of its formal qualities and its formal arrangements. Likewise, with artwork, uh, sculpture, et cetera, from other um, uh, other countries and other histories. That's not to say that the historical origins of those work is unimportant, but I don't have to have that information to engage with it critically from a formalist perspective. This theory can help explain the lasting attention we, we pay to great works of art in terms of the properties of the work itself. So if there's a fixed set of properties of the work and a fixed set of human biology, which is receptive to those properties, then we can explain why generation after generation, these works of art uh, continue to inspire uh, aesthetic admiration. And this theory can accommodate a wide variety of new kinds of art. We might look at Amish quilts from the perspective of formalism, whereas previously they would not have been regarded as serious candidates for works of art, they are nevertheless candidates as objects of our aesthetic attention. And we might look at the formal elements and the arrangements of formal uh, principles by which those elements have been um, developed and arranged. Problems, well, there does not seem to be a strong distinction between anything and works of art the role of intention seems to be lost. What I mean by that is if anything can be the object of our aesthetic attention or almost anything can be the object of aesthetic attention, then it's not entirely clear what distinguishes works of art from non-works of art. So maybe we have to supplement that with, it has to have been intentionally produced or something like that. Maybe, maybe not. Also, it seems uh, no good at accounting for certain works of art. So for instance, the blues or rock music, um, it doesn't seem like what the artist is going for in the blues is a uh, formally fascinating construction. Maybe Baroque, right? Maybe uh, classical music, but it seems that the, the blues artist is pursuing other values. And to um, diminish the value of the blues because it isn't as formally complex or formally fascinating uh, as a fugue, for instance, might be to overlook the values that are present in these other kinds of art forms. So uh, similarly, it seems that highly mimetic art of representational art, right? I think about you know, the Middle Ages and a lot of the religious art that was created was very important to the artist and to the people who were creating those works, what they represented, the stories they were trying to depict, the characters they were trying to depict, uh, the moral messages they were trying to represent. And to overlook all of that and simply talk about the balance and the form and the colors might be to miss the values that work of art or those works of art uh, sought to, to uh, embody. Further, it would, find, it would imply that very close copies of works of art are as good as the originals. So notice if I created a, something that was very, very similar, perhaps even indistinguishable from the Mona Lisa, no one would say, oh my gosh, it's another Mona Lisa. They say, no, that's a copy, right? Now, formally, it's the same, same elements, same principles, but we wouldn't think it is of equal value to the original Mona Lisa. Formalism doesn't account for that. So maybe again, there are other values that works of art uh, embody that formalism is missing. Nevertheless, this provides us with another set of aesthetic reasons to consider when evaluating a work of art. We may wish to attend to the, uh, it should be formal elements and their arrangements according to formal principles. We might analyze the symphony with regard to point and counterpoint, the resolution of a chord progression, etc. In music, in particular, aesthetic satisfaction is often had by a piece of music building up an expectation. Da, 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 da. So I start the expectation, 
da, 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 da. Then I resolve the expectation, but perhaps in a surprising way, da, or perhaps in a more standard way, da, 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 da. In any event, the reason you have an expectation is because you brought to your appreciation of music a pre-existing sense of music syntax. You have an understanding of what a tonal progression should sound like. And the only reason I'm able to satisfy or frustrate that is because of your pre-existing knowledge of music syntax. And I don't mean you sat through a music theory class, maybe you have, or maybe you studied music, but even non-musicians do have that sense of musical syntax. So again, that would be a nod to formalism. Uh, if the point of music is to present us with objects that fascinate us aesthetically because of their reliance on formal elements and formal principles, then that would be uh, that would be a you know a, a case in, for in favor of musical formalism. Number three, expressive theory. Expressive theory claims that the point of art or the function of art or the value of art is that it expresses feelings and or other mental content of the artist. That art is a vehicle for expressing feelings and emotion. Right? <laughs> so again, this was a view that became popular more recently. In the, uh, probably the uh, 18th and 19th century. Part of the attraction of this view is that it locates art as a natural, irreducible human activity common to all cultures. One, one proponent of this view is the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, and he thought that that is, the, that is the real unique thing about art, that we use words to express ideas, but we use art to express feelings. And only art can give us this uh, ability to express and communicate feelings with one another. So it's a natural, it's as art then is as natural uh, and this, this uh, um, artistic expression is as natural to human beings as language. It finds the value of art in the communication and or self-discovery that art makes possible and acknowledges the profound emotional impact art can have on the viewers and the artists. So this is something that was not necessarily clear from the mimetic point of view or from the formalist point of view. Here, this is um, celebrating the fact that art can evoke emotions, perhaps even emotions of life. Pache, uh, Clive Bell. It is important to recognize that expressing one's emotions is not the same thing as reporting my emotions. So I might say, I am feeling sad, period. That's a report, that's not an expression. But if I went, that's an expression, right? And expressing emotions is something else. So I am feeling sad. You have an intellectual appreciation, but you don't necessarily feel my pain. But notice if I stub my toe, you might literally go, Ooh, right? Well, all of a sudden you're kind of vicariously experiencing my pain. That's what expressive theorists have in mind when they're talking about the ability of art to express. Now, I have to say that there's a bit of ambiguity about the notion of expression. And one can mean at least two importantly different things. There's what I call two-term two expression and three-term expression. What do I have in mind here? Well, two-term expression is when I, the artist, create the work to express in a sense to externalize some internal content. I'm feeling something, I don't know what I'm feeling, and I don't know what I'm feeling until I get it out, until I express. Think about pushing out uh, clay, right, to extrude, right? I'm getting it out so that I can understand what it is. This is different than what I call three-term expression, where I, the artist, create an art object to express to you an audience. So in the first case, it's the artist and the object. In the second, three term, it's the artist, the object, and the audience, the, the receiver of the expression. Here in three term expression, it's really more of a communication. Frankly, this is what Tolstoy had in mind as an expressive theorist. He thought it was essentially an, an act of communication. Not all expressive theorists do, Tolstoy did though. <laughs> so in the two term, the artist is merely making public what he or she is thinking or feeling. 
if this is the point of art or the function of art, then good art is art which succeeds at exhausting and materializing that internal content. Whether anybody gets it or not is irrelevant. All that is necessary is for me to have successfully externalized what I had been internalizing. But this raises more questions. Is this really just the same as sort of venting? Right? Normally, we would not say that every expressive act is an art act, that every time I express and I vent in that sense, I'm engaged in an artistic activity. If all this means is venting, then art becomes a sort of therapy. But this is counterintuitive. Certainly, it can't account for all art. Further, where is the value to the public at large? Also, how is it that one can evaluate art? Is there good or bad art? or merely successful and less successful therapy sessions? Does this view commit us to this position that all sincere art is good? So as long as I'm sincere, I might have, you know, in my hometown, they used to, uh, right around Mother's Day, um, solicit uh, individuals to send in poems about their mother. No doubt, each and every one of these poems uh, were quite sincere. And we might even say they were sincere expressions of the love that these individuals felt for their mother. But some of them were just terrible poems, right? I remember one, oh, mother dear, I cry a tear because you're not near to calm my fear. It went on, right? So, but I, I want to say in that case, it doesn't matter how sincere that was. That was a terrible poem. So the expressive theory has uh, as, a, as the only thing that can recommend an art as a work of art seems problematic in the face of, of such bad poetry. Right? In the three-term model, we have the art, the work, and the receiver of the expression. The point of art then is to communicate or transmit sincere emotions. Tolstoy talks about the artwork infecting the receiver with the emotion that was previously experienced by the artist. So uh, for, on Tolstoy's view, this can only be done via art. Art therefore is the single vehicle for building communal emotions and thereby communities. So from Tolstoy's perspective, the reason we have communities is because we can have these shared emotional moments where the artist presents us with the work and everyone goes, oh, yes, exactly. And we all have this common moment. We're not only united, uh, and have a kind of, um, you, uh, achieve a kind of um, unity with the artist and the mind of the artist, but also with everyone else who's having that same moment, right? So this is what allows for the creation and the sustaining of strong communities would be these opportunities for building uh, common moments of emotional um, solidarity. Uh, this can explain the power and importance of art historically and contemporarily. It can explain why national anthems are such a big deal and um, uh, uh, why, why certain touchstone works of art uh, and music, uh, painting, sculpture, uh, buildings, architecture seem to be so important to sustaining a community. It does justice to some of the experiences we have when viewing art. I've had this experience where I've listened to a, a piece of music uh, or I've seen a, a, a painting or I've read a poem and I've said, oh, exactly, yes, that's exactly it. That's exact. I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Why? Because it's almost like you've, you've revealed to me something I've, you've been able to say exactly what I've been feeling all along. You've encapsulated my, my, my own feelings. We're of a single mind, right? Um, and it locates in art a kind of quasi-cognitive function that's irreplaceable by the sciences. So these are things that sort of recommend the expressive theory. But the ability of art to resonate with a particular audience might change over time. Given a different audience, they may not get it. In other words, the work which is powerfully received by one audience, generations later or, or a continent uh, away, may not be able to generate that same kind of response. So there does seem to be um, uh, an unreliability about what constitutes a great work of art since its ability to um, present or, or to elicit these strong emotional responses may shift 
with audience to audience to audience. It would seem odd to say that works of art stop being great when you put them in front of a different set of eyes. To say this would imply that the greatness of the work was not a stable feature of the work at all. And so these are things that we'd have to think about when evaluating the expressive theory of art. Nevertheless, this third theory, theory rather, provides us with a third set of aesthetic reasons to consider when evaluating a work of art, namely the ability of the work of art to express. The more powerfully and universally a work of art expresses, the greater its aesthetic achievement. We might also consider the significance of what is being expressed. That actually leads us to our next view, the romantic theory of art. And as I said, the romantic theory of art is sort of a variant of the expressive theory. Here, the idea uh, that art is a communication of our most important ideas. Uh, art is the symbolic communication which expresses cultural, moral, political, and religious ideas. And so uh, uh, it is keeping the idea that it's expressing, but it wants to say that, and it's expressing the big ideas, the most important ones. Romantic theorists suggest that the rational investigation of reality, science, can only reveal part of reality. There are sort of mystical or supra-rational uh, truths that only imagination and passion can articulate. So think of, you know, romantic heroes, romantic novels, etc. They seem to gesture at what science cannot uh, quite capture or explain. This is the value of art, they say. It communicates to us the part of reality which science cannot. The romantic view of George Hegel Art is supposed to communicate or symbolize the most important political, social, moral, religious ideas of the community to that community. So it's symbolizing and sending back to them, here's what you're most interested in. Here's what you're most concerned about. Here's what you most esteem. Here's what you're most um, uh, uh, detest. And art is able to distill and represent back to the community those things that are of most interest and most important to that community. Art which does this well is good art. Art which does this poorly is bad art. And art which doesn't do this is not really art at all. If it's not about big ideas, then it isn't really art according to the romantic theory of art. Hegel claimed that the aim of art was beauty, but he understood beauty to be what happens when an important idea is given adequate form. Again, it's, it's, it's um, represented, well, represented is the wrong word, but expressed, right? Expressed in an adequate way. Hence for Hegel, art was always about important ideas. He thought that there were real forms of art that were always the go-to for any human society to express its most important ideas. He thought any human society has always historically and, and will um, um, uh, continue into the future, express its most important ideas through architecture, sculpture, painting, poetry, and music, right? So this is um, related to the notion of the fine arts. If the romantic theory of art is true, and that art is always about expressing our most important ideas, it stands to reason that not every artistic medium is suitable for expressing really serious ideas, at least not in a reliable way. So for instance, does ice dancing express our most important ideas? It's beautiful, it can be uh, artistically uh, creative, but is it our go-to for expressing, again, our religious, our political, our social ideas? If the answer to that is no, then it wouldn't be a legitimate art form, or at least not one of the most important art forms from the perspective of the romantic theory of art. Hegel thought that these, uh, uh, the art, the genuine artistic um, media fall into three main categories. The symbolic, where matter dominates and is highly symbolized uh, the mental content, the spirit or the mental content, it's, it's there, but it's highly uh, symbolized and it, the, the, um, the matter predominance. Uh, he thinks that for instance, architecture is a symbolic form of art. Because notice while the Egyptian pyramids do express a lot about what they thought about, 
politics, what they thought about um, the afterlife and theology, etc. Um, the first thing that strikes you when you look at the pyramid is, man, that's a lot of rock. Right? So the matter is what strikes you first. You can get to the, the intellectual, the spiritual, the, the mental, but only in a highly symbolic form. In classical works of art, according to Hegel, the two matter and spirit achieve a kind of equilibrium. He suggested that Greek, Greek sculpture, uh, you have this kind of equilibrium of matter and form. And then in the romantic, he thinks the, the, uh, the ideas, the spirit, the mental content uh, dominates and the matter is subservient or perhaps even irrelevant. So notice whether I, um, where, whether I read a poem uh, in a paperback or in a hardcover, or whether it's a sans serif font or it's a serif font, none of that matters, right? Whether I'm reading it on a computer screen, the matter of the poem is far less important than the idea or the spirit of the poem. So that's what he has in mind in terms of romantic art. He thought that paint, poetry and painting are the most romantic of the romantic arts. Romantic theory, uh, agrees that art is a way of expressing important ideas in a way that science, philosophy, and religion cannot. Therefore, art becomes a kind of supra-rational activity, a deeper reality which reason cannot touch. So only madness can touch this supra-rational reality. The artist is a sort of madman poet uh, that is able to uh, communicate to us what science cannot. Uh, the, the, the heart has reasons that reason cannot understand. It's very sort of romantic. In other words, there are features of human existence that are beyond the ability of reason and science. Um, notice the, the romantic period as a period of, of Western history comes after the enlightenment and it results as a kind of disenchantment with the enlightenment and the kind of mechanistic view of human nature that we get with that um, Newtonian mechanistic science and physics. And I was looking for something else, pining for something else. And so what we find in uh, these uh, literature and paintings of this period are certain recurring themes, the moon, madness, love, candlelight, death, magic, spirit, the failure of reason. Think of uh, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein right? is a cautionary tale against you enlightenment people who think your science can solve all the problems. Well, that, how did that turn out, right? Or Robert Le Diable is considered the first romantic ballet. It was actually an opera, um, uh, uh, Robert Le, Le Diable, but the first romantic ballet was a, was a, the, um, a ballet that took place in the opera. And it was uh, the Ballet of the Nuns which is a kind of a saucy tale there, but uh, I'll let you Google it if you're interested. But Giselle, if you're familiar with the ballet Giselle, you have um, Giselle is this, this ethereal creature that um, uh, Siegfried is um, uh, pursuing, uh, but ultimately he cannot, he cannot capture her because she's this creature of spirit and he's, he's stuck in the world of, of, uh, of, of signs. So if art is a vehicle for expression, then we must entertain the proposition that not all arts are created equal since some modes of communication are more central to human beings. Image and word uh, is uh, what Hegel would have us believe, right? Hence painting and poetry, uh, but literature in general, not just, uh, not just poetry. So the fine arts, painting, poetry, sculpture, architecture, music, music there perhaps by the skin of its teeth because it does not support communication of ideas as such, but performs a kind of quasi-linguistic function. But this is the notion of the fine arts. Um, and that's the idea that these artistic media are most suited for communicating important ideas. Hence, societies have always had and rely on these five, again, architecture, sculpture, music, painting, poetry, literature, as a means of expressing their most serious ideas. These uh, theories started to articulate themselves in the 1700s. A lot of art was produced either with this in mind, that their job is to communicate important ideas, or with this as a sort of background theory, um, and quite consciously by artists who accepted that account of what art was supposed to do. Good art is that which adequately expresses important cultural ideas. And if it did not, 
it is considered bad art or perhaps not really art at all. This provides a framework for distinguishing between fine arts and what might be called pop art, decorator art, or kitsch. So now the very distinction between the fine arts and the not fine arts in the 20th century came to be questioned. And you had the elevation of um, what we might call craft art as being taken just as seriously as the fine arts, et cetera. But that was sort of a 20th century development more recently. As a version of the expressive theory of art, the romantic theory of art is stressing the expressive abilities of the fine arts. What recommends and separates them from other artistic media is their, uh, is their unique ability to achieve these expressions. Further, they emphasize the seriousness of the ideas expressed and the ability of art, not unlike Freud's conception of dream analysis, to reveal ourselves to ourselves. So remember, Freud thinks that by studying our dreams, which notice our dreams are not rational, our dreams are highly symbolic, our dreams are charged with emotion and passion and feeling, but by studying our dreams, we have a better access to who we are, what we're worried about, what we are concerned with, what we love, what we hate, etc. Well, on a similar view of art, the artists then are the sort of public dreamers. They're presenting to us our dreams, They're not our literal dreams, but the public dreams, what we're concerned about, what, we're, uh, what we detest, what we admire, um, what are our values. And so our artists uh, are able to tell us who we are, again, in a highly symbolic way. Number five is a genuine set apart theory called media formalism. It's related to formalism proper, <laughs> but this theory suggests that the point of a work of art is to expand, develop, or comment upon the artistic medium to which it belongs. So it too is a version of art for art's sake, but what it's saying is the value of art is, or the job of art is to comment on or to expand art. Art should be about art. Paintings should be about painting. Music should be about music. Um, sculpture should be about sculpture. Like formalism, it seeks to find uh, identity criteria and evaluative criteria in the works of art, not by the works of art's relation to something external to the artistic process, but rather by the relationship of the work of art to something internal. So again, how does that work fit within the history of art? Um, is it expanding art? Is it commenting on art? So there's a self-referential quality to works of art, or at least uh, from the point of view of media formalism, there should be a self-referential quality to works of art. Media form formalism seems to rest on two assumptions, that works of art fall more or less neatly into separate artistic media, such as painting, printmaking, sculpture, music, uh, uh, theater, etc., and that there is a value uh, uh, unique to the medium, which is enhanced and increased by developments and expansions of that medium. So you want to say that art is of a value, but more narrowly, this artistic medium, let's say painting, is of value. So painting has its own unique values, and those values are enhanced and, and uh, magnified when you expand and comment on and uh, take painting someplace it's never been before. This is a self-referential element of the arts for art's sake movement taken to its logical extreme. Art is literally about art. Again, painting about painting, dance about dance. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, let me go back for a second. I'm thinking about the minimalist movements in art of the, um, of the uh, mid-century to early uh, to late 20th century, right? Um, where they said, look, what can we take away from a painting and still have a painting? What if we take away representational uh, um, uh, content? Is it still a painting? What if we take away um, a particular shaped canvas? Is it still a painting? Well, what if we take away um, differences in color? Can we have a monochromatic painting that is right, just all black or something like that? Then you might think, well, what was the point of that? Well, notice they were making art that was about art. You know, what is, is there an essential nature to art? And is there something which is indispensable uh, from art? 
but it was experiments that you and notice what they weren't doing. They weren't saying, oh, look at what I'm representing. They weren't saying, oh, isn't this aesthetically fascinating? They weren't saying, oh, isn't this expressive? No, their works were art that was about art. In this case, paintings that were about paintings. A similar um, a set of experiments and, and developments went on in the world of dance, right? Uh, does dance need to have costumes? Does it need to have trained dancers? Does it need to be uh, displays of technique, etc.? And so there was all this experimentation that was being done in movement resolutions and this sort of stuff. And I have to tell you, some of it is the most boring dance that you've ever seen. But if you're bringing the expectations of, let's say, formalism to a work which was created on the values of media formalism, you're applying the wrong evaluative criteria, or at least an unsatisfying set of evaluative criteria. So the prose, it explains the value we place on novelty and innovation. Remember, that was something that the, the, uh, the old ordinary formalist can't do. Again, why do we evaluate, why do we value the original more than the copy? It does give voice to some of self-stated goals of certain artists and certain movements, right? Where they said, oh, I wanted to do something different, right? Picasso in his cubist movement wanted to take painting someplace it had never been before. Painting had up to that point wanted to render one side of an, uh, of an object at a time where Picasso was trying to render multiple sides of the same object at the same time. It's useful prism through which to see the history of art as one of evolution and growth. How one uh, uh, school of art led to another school of art, led to another school of art as a way of developing and commenting on and perhaps uh, rejecting certain values pursued by previous schools of art. Con, it hardly seems to be the value that most have found or currently even find in art. So it's not always clear that novelty was the only or the main thing that people were looking for in works of art. Uh, it cuts art off from courses of life that give meaning and importance to human existence. So the danger is if it becomes too self-referential, too self-obsessed, then you start having artists who are creating artwork, which is about art for other artists or art theorists. But the general public is left mystified by that, right? Why is this interesting or why should I find this interesting? I don't even know how to engage with it, right? If that happens, then the danger is that this, this um, tradition of art has become so um, detached from other streams of human existence and human importance that it ceases to have any real value for a, a large portion of society. I think it's better used perhaps as a measure of artistic value rather than aesthetic value. And these might be different things to talk about, but not in this lecture. Um, so, but nevertheless, here's a fourth set of evaluative criteria to consider when evaluating art. Essentially art which is derivative would be considered less valuable than art which is unique and avant-garde. Right. So, and this is something that uh, is talked about in art theory and art criticism. And when people are evaluating works of art and they might hold up an individual artist or an individual work because of its uniqueness, because it's a trailblazing and it's an avant-garde. One might deride something as derivative. Well, he's just doing what so-and-so used to do, right? Art which takes the medium someplace it has never been before is said to be valued more highly than art which merely revisits established tropes. So if I do another watercolor of another bowl of fruit, it might be aesthetically pleasing, formalism. It might be representative, media, um, mimetic theory. Uh, maybe it even evokes some sort of emotion in you, expressive, but it's another bowl of fruit. Um, some to, oh, the final one that we're going to look at only briefly is some 20th and 21st century estheticians suggest that there is no common essence to works of art. We find no shared properties, functions, or responses by which to group all and only artworks together, no matter how hard we try. So they say, well, look, when we try to say what is it that all and only artwork has in common by virtue of which it is art, we can't find it. We can't find a common definition, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. This is a view called anti-essentialism. And anti-essentialism is a view that denies that there is any single unifying nature to art 
objects, a sine qua non, by virtue of which they are art objects. So there is no essence to art. This view is held by those who claim that the concept of art evolves and changes over time in the same way that biological evolution denies a single permanent nature to species. And by those who claim that to be an object of art uh, is to satisfy one of several definitions. So they say, look, that's just not gonna work that to be a, an object of art requires that you satisfy some set of necessary and sufficient conditions. They suggest that the only things that artworks have in common is that they all have the social status of art. So they see art as having a kind of social status. To be a work of art is to be a, a, an object of uh, social construction. This view maintains that what makes artworks artworks is that they have the status of arthood bestowed upon them by the art world. <coughs> so notice if I find a piece of driftwood over on Miami Beach, it's not a work of art. But if I put it in an art gallery and the I have an unveiling and I take off the little veil and I say, voila, I give you a piece of driftwood I found on Miami Beach. Well, maybe it is art now, right? So it hasn't changed chemically, it hasn't changed physically, but it has undergone a kind of social transformation in the same way that when I marry, I undergo a social transformation. I don't change chemically, I don't change physically, but I take on new social dimensions. People regard me differently. They bring to me different expectations than they would bring an unmarried person. They afford me different privileges than they would afford an unmarried person. Um, uh, they regard me and have expectations that are unique. Well, some would suggest that when I, that driftwood now takes on the status of art object, we bring to it different expectations, we afford to it different privileges, uh, we interact with it and we regard it differently. And that is a social reality, not some sort of uh, chemical reality. The art world, the art world is that institution appealed to philosophers like Arthur Danto and George Dickey uh, and others holding the institutional theory of art, which is composed of artists, curators, critics, estheticians, art appreciators, etc. These persons offer and accept objects as art objects. So it's the art world that confers this arthood on supposed art objects. The problem, this definition is at least apparently circular. That is, the art world is composed in part of artists, but artists are people who produce art. So you have this circle of concepts that are kind of self, uh, uh, you're defining one concept in terms of another concept, which is defined in terms of a circular concept. Those who hold the theory maintain that this is a useful concept, nonetheless, for sorting out certain puzzles about the nature of art. Notice that among other issues, one problem with this account of art is that it sees art as completely a creation of particular cultures and potentially without any inherent value. Given its anti-essential nature, this view of art could not specify what features a work of art should possess in order to be praiseworthy, since it can't specify what features a work of art must possess in order to be a work of art in the first place. Right, so I can't tell you what the good making qualities of art are because I can't even tell you what the necessary qualities of art are, if I'm an anti-essentialist, that is. It does, however, elevate the importance of art historians, critics, and experts of art, uh, of the art world in the estimation of art. So it would seem that if it's the art world that conveys art hood, it would be the art world which are the judges of good art bad art, superior art, excellent art, um, and, uh, and non-art, right? So the, the, the art world would then be the court of final appeal in any evaluation of art. And so that concludes our remarks then on aesthetic reasoning. I hope you found this helpful. Naturally, if you have any questions, please contact me.